joining our first wellness webinar here at CHI Health. Well, life has changed quite a bit since the beginning of COVID. Now going into the holidays, we have many questions about how to celebrate safely, eat sensibly, and not pack on the pounds as we enjoy our favorite holiday goodies. There are also a lot of questions about COVID-19 in general, about the virus, about the vaccine. And we have several experts here today to answer your questions and more. We have infectious disease experts, diet nutritionist experts, mental health and fitness. But before we get started, I just wanna remind you of a few things. You can ask us anything throughout the Q&A, throughout the webinar in the Q&A function, and that is located at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna be answering your questions live. So send those in. You can ask questions on the diet, exercise, mental health, COVID. Again, all those experts are here to answer those questions. Now this webinar is being recorded. So if you can't watch the whole thing or you have to pop in and out, we will be posting this online. Look out for that link throughout the webinar as well. And make sure you stay with us for a chance to win a Fitbit Inspire 2. Five lucky winners will be taking one of these home. Again, we're gonna announce those names throughout the webinar today, so be sure to stay tuned. Well, let's go ahead and jump in. Joining me live here is CHI Health infectious disease expert, Dr. David Quimby. Dr. Quimby um, has largely led our COVID care here at CHI Health, and he's here to answer several questions about the virus um, and how we celebrate the holidays safely. So let's go ahead and dive in. I do have, uh, we're first gonna talk about the vaccine, Dr. Quimby. So there are a lot of things in the news right now um, about that vaccine. I believe Pfizer announced that they have one that's relatively ready to go. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about where we're at with that? What this announcement means, maybe some of the things that we still have to get to before it's approved and available to the public. Okay, um, thanks for having me. Uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. Keep in mind what has been put out there was a uh, release from the company the actual data, at least as of three or four hours ago, when I started my workday had not been released for independent analysis. But if they're reporting a 90% success rate with approximately 80 to 85 people who had contracted infected in COVID infections, that means that less than 10 got infected as opposed to the vast majority who um, didn't get the vaccine had most of the infections. There are several things we don't know um, how long that will last. Uh, various other vaccines, you have to have a booster every so long or your immunity starts to wane and it's way too early to know anything about that. There's also, how does the average person get a vaccine? Right now, um, they have not even applied for what's called an EUA or an emergency use authorization. That's where they present information to the FDA saying, hey, we have this, we think it's good but the full data isn't necessarily there yet. And the FDA can look at it and decide if it's worthwhile to use in emergency situations like a pandemic, okay? So once they have enough data on safety, which is enough people being so many months after receiving their vaccines, then the FDA will decide if it's going to give an EUA or not. That's different than full FDA approval for which you need a lot more information. This vaccine has to be kept really, really cold in order to continue to work. So there has to be distribution uh, network in place, which has been being worked on by various states along the way. So it wouldn't be a last minute thing. Average person, not a frontline worker, which frontline workers include people in hospitals and even I would consider people in grocery stores, um, convenience stores, restaurants, um, might not be able to get the vaccine until sometime next year um, because they have to produce more and be able to get it out there. Mm -hmm. And I did want to mention quickly, Dr. Quimby and I are spaced six feet apart. That's why we're not wearing masks. Um, but everybody else here in the room today with us has a mask on. We're all socially distanced um, and we're not going to be seated next to each other for longer than 15 minutes. So taking all the precautions, um, which is something obviously that you have helped us guide us through during this process, Dr. Quimby. So thank you. Jumping back to the vaccine, we do want to talk about what this means exactly. I mean, you know, I know you mentioned it could be a while before the general public is available to get it. But does this announcement mark any sort of progress for the infectious disease world or the, gen the, the public in general? Sure, because before they started the large trials with the vaccines, they knew that pretty much all of them made an antibody response in the volunteers who took the vaccine. But that's great. There's a difference though between an antibody response and actually not getting sick. So by having some phase three data, which is a large scale, it showed that people who received active vaccine 
we're actually less likely to become ill, which is assuming the data is borne out after it's reviewed. What could a timeline for distribution, I mean, I know you talked about it a little bit, but what could it really, what can people look forward to? Is there a date, um, you know, that we can say, hopefully we'll have a vaccine by this time? Um, or is it really just kind of taking it a day at a time and seeing where we're at? I would say, honestly, take it a day at a time, see where we're at, let the data be reviewed because you do not want to mass distribute a vaccine that could have some safety issues or something like that. And if they apply for an EUA and get it in November um, and the infrastructure is there, it could hopefully start being distributed to the uh, first line individuals in December and January, and then hopefully other people later on as more becomes available. Okay, we're going to move on to our holiday questions and how we can celebrate the holidays safely. I know that's something that's on the minds of many, including mm -hmm. mine. Um, with Thanksgiving coming up, can I have my family over? If I have a large family, what's a safe number? If you want to be perfectly honest here, the safe number is one, you. Okay, the more people you have together, the better chance you have of somebody being asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and infecting other people. In the last few months, the CDC has come out with data that most of the spread is not necessarily from super huge large gatherings, but if you look at actual numbers from smaller gatherings in homes or smaller gatherings between homes, which is exactly what holiday meals are. Okay. Um, again, you can submit your questions live. I have a iPad here where I'm monitoring them. So please do submit your questions if you have them. Um, how do we eat and stay six feet apart? Is that possible? Can, can we sit at the same table? Well, you know, in those movies, a really long time. <laughs> okay. Uh, eating is not considered the safest activity because you do not have a mask on while you're eating. So if you're at a standard table and you're sitting next to somebody that's not considered safe unless they're part of your inner circle, like your household where you always have contact with them. So having people from out of your household eating at the same table with you is not considered the safest of activities. By definition, it would be considered an exposure because your standard meal for a holiday is more than 15 minutes. So a lot of people traveling for the holidays, mm -hmm. say my kids are flying in, do they need to quarantine? And if so, how long? Quarantining before you leave for the trip would not be necessarily all that helpful because then you have the airports, you have the airplane, and then the disembarking type of thing. There was a recent study I read, I think it came out over the weekend or I read it over the weekend about in airplane transmission, which might not be as bad as people think it is. But it was a study, not a real world situation, um, where there was a mannequin putting out puffs of aerosol every so many times a minute, like someone breathing. And then they saw how much aerosol they could get in other parts of the cabin. And it wasn't as bad as they feared. But that is an airplane in flight, not the airplane sitting on the jetway for 30 minutes waiting to take off, not you standing in the security line waiting to get screened, and not you sitting at baggage claim. If you were quarantined and then you were exposed in the airport, you could theoretically infect other family members um, a day or two or three after you arrived at your destination. Mm -hmm. Um, switching back to celebrating with family, let's talk a little bit more about elderly family members, you know, inviting grandma and grandpa to the Thanksgiving celebration as you typically would, or maybe they host it, um, but you don't feel like that's a safe thing this year. What recommendations do you have there? Is it safe to celebrate with the elderly? This is hard because you might not have seen these family members for a long time. And if you're mentioning elderly family members, honestly, you I don't know their health. I don't know how many more holidays that you can have an actual gathering. So just having a blanket, no, you're not celebrating, is not necessarily the safest thing to do. There are some things you can do to try to mitigate the risk. Um, I mean, people don't all have to eat together. You can separate who's eating at a certain time. If they are visiting your home and they're not part of your home, um, people can have masks inside their house. There's no rule saying that you can't have masks in your house if you're around other people who are not part of your household. And that can help limit the risk. It doesn't make it to zero, but simple things like that can help limit it. Okay, you just mentioned precautions and we had a question come in live. Can we have separate tables for each family and wear masks the rest of the time and still be safe for Thanksgiving? Safer, okay. 
because there's now the only pure safety is you by yourself in the middle of a forest with nobody around you for a mile, which is not very realistic. So you try to do what is safe as possible, as in not eating right next to somebody else, um, masking when you're in the home if they're not part of your home. Make sure your mask is on properly. People actually do most of their breathing through their nose. So if your nose is hanging out, you might as well not be wearing one. Um, those type of things make it safer, not zero, but can be much safer. You talked a little bit about travel and I wanna go back to that. Um, we've heard a lot of things about nose spray before flying. Um, does that lessen your chances of getting COVID? I actually read one study this weekend about ferrets and um, well, ferrets are a good model for COVID. Don't you have COVID. a ferret? We, we had a ferret. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, rest <laughs> in peace, Finn. Um, and they're a good model for COVID for a few reasons. But um, with a certain protein spray that they could get, which tended to block transmission. That is nowhere near human studies yet. So I'm assuming this is talking about like normal moisturizing nose sprays. Um, that can keep your nasal mucosa healthier. So maybe less likely to get infections in general, but I would not put my safety on a bar of, on a bottle of ocean nose spray. Okay. Um, we're, we also have heard a lot about zinc mm -hmm. and vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Will those keep you from getting COVID or sick during the holiday season? Most people are not zinc deficient. Um, so you don't necessarily need supplementation. There are data with other viruses like cold ease lozenges where you can decrease how sick you are if you start taking it as soon as you become ill. There are no data on that for um, COVID to my knowledge at this time. Vitamin D, um, a lot of people here in Nebraska area tend to be deficient come winter time because it's always cloudy and they're not outside. Vitamin D is involved with the immune system so if you are vitamin D deficient, you might be more prone to getting infections. Um, you can overdose on vitamin D, so don't take it willy nilly, but a little supplement of that, there's no strong evidence it might be, there's no strong evidence it would be helpful, but it is likely not going to hurt and might have some benefit. Don't overdose on it though. We're kind of jumping all around as questions come in here live, but is it safe to have elderly family members visit if they live in assisted living? First thing I would do is check with the rules of the assisted living because different places are different and they might have rules about them being allowed to leave the facility because they don't necessarily want to bring things into their facility. Um, the biggest risk would be how much of a community setting there is at the assisted facility if things are brought in there. So follow their rules there. But otherwise it would be the same risk for them as any other family member to where is it worth the benefit for the risk you're taking? Mm -hmm. Back to the vaccine now. Dr. Fauci said a successful COVID vaccine would have major impacts on everything we do with respect to COVID. What would those impacts be and look like? How would a vaccine change things? A vaccine would change things because once it is out there and once enough people have taken it and once people have more immunity, you will stop having the market increase in number of people who have infected and number of people in hospitals. The main driver of all of the um, health measures and everything put into place is to try to keep pe too many people from being in the hospital at one time, because then you can't take care of them. So if we have people who are not likely to be in the hospital because the vaccine either prevents them from getting ill or prevents them from having more severe illness if they do become ill, we don't know if that happens yet, they haven't released that little bit of information, then you need less health measures because you're not going to have the overwhelming bloom of people filling up hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, back to Thanksgiving. If I test positive for COVID-19 a couple weeks before Thanksgiving, but receive a result saying I no longer have it, is it safe to be with my family, especially grandparents? Repeat testing is generally not recommended um, to know if you're able to transmit it to somebody else at this time. If you're normal, um, good immune system, and you've had more than 10 days from the onset of your symptoms, it's felt you're pretty much unlikely to be able to spread it. There are some caveats in there to where if you don't have a good immune system, and, or if you receive some steroids or something like that to help you through, you were sick enough to be in the hospital, that maybe you can spread it longer than those 10 days. But I would ask with that gathering, you might be okay to not to spread it, but if there's a uh, eight other people there, 
you don't know everybody else's situation and what they may be bringing in. You might not be able to catch it, but your friend um, Mary might be able to pass it along to your other friend Bob who's visiting. Mm -hmm. um, if you test positive for COVID, we know a lot about antibodies um, and obviously that those can help fight the, the virus off again. Um, but if you test positive for COVID once, are you then immune? Again, this question has been coming up since March. Ask again in a year. We do have clear evidence that some people have been infected more than once. Is that common? Right now, it does not seem to be common. And we don't know how long immunity lasts. Unfortunately, something like measles, where you get a vaccine or actual measles, and then you're immune for life, tends to be not the norm with a lot of respiratory type of infections. So there is a we don't know how long it's going to last. At least it's looking like at least uh, three months or so, um, perhaps longer, but there's really not enough information to give a good answer to that other than, I don't know. We have time for one more question before we switch gears. How many units of vitamin D is recommended for someone? First answer is always talk to your general doc about that, okay, because they know about your own particular health situation and that kind of deal. If you're very deficient, you get a lot more than somebody who is not deficient. But a standard dose of 2,500 um, units per day of D3 is likely to not get people into trouble. But I'd recommend talking to your own health provider about that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Quimby, for all your insight. And please do continue to submit your questions in the live chat. Uh, we'll hopefully be able to touch base with you a little bit later in the webinar. Um, next, we're gonna focus on nutrition. So how many of you packed on the pounds during the first round of COVID quarantine uh, I know that I struggled with that as well as nutrition and reaching for all the snacks in the pantry and um, just really reaching for that comfort food. So we, we found ourselves doing that a lot. So to avoid the unwanted excess pounds, let's check in with CHI Health Executive Chef Kurt Kenkel, and he's going to prepare a dish for us that tastes good and looks good as well. Hi, my name is Kurt Kenkel. I am the Executive Chef for CHI Health. Um, I am oversee all of the food prep and menus for all of our 14 different hospitals in the system. Uh, today, we're gonna go through a holiday recipe that because of the COVID, we probably won't have large gatherings and be able to roast a whole bird. So we're gonna start with a turkey breast. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is take all of the uh, skin off of the turkey breast. It's really simple. You just lift the skin up a little bit and very carefully peel it back with the edge of your knife. You're then gonna open up the breast and you'll see the tenderloin underneath. Inside of there, we're just gonna make one small cut and that will come right out and we'll set that off to the side. So because we're preparing an individual plate today, we're going to be cutting this into smaller portions. We don't wanna cook the whole uh, turkey breast whole. So we're just very carefully make small slices through the breast, try to get them as even as possible. Okay, from there, we're gonna lay them out, turn our stove on, we're gonna do about medium high heat. We're gonna add a couple tablespoons of olive oil. We're gonna take some salt and pepper, season both sides of the turkey cutlets. Let our pan get warm. So once our oil is hot, we're gonna Carefully put the turkey in. What we're going to try and do here is get a little browning. Make sure it stays loose in the pan. probably about two to three minutes per side, depending on how thick your cut is and how hot your pan is. Okay, so once we get the browning to start on the turkey, we're gonna flip it all over. We're going to, again, depending on how thick the cuts are, you have to determine how long it'll take to finish cooking the turkey through without drying it out. But our next step is gonna to be to add a few apple slices. Shallots, gonna add equal parts apple cider and sodium free chicken stock. Or 
final step is going to be to swirl in a little bit of oat fat sour cream. So before we plate the dish, let's talk about the sides that go along with it. During the holidays, bread dressing is a pretty popular item. Uh, one of the variations that I like to make starts with uh, Mexican chorizo sausage. Um, that gets sauteed and browned. Uh, and then you're gonna add in Brussels sprouts, butternut squash, um, and cook those when they're about half cooked, add in uh, the celery and onions, about six minutes into it. Uh, and then you're gonna deglaze with a little bit of chicken broth. Toss your dry breadcrumbs and all your vegetables together. Uh, you can find that recipe online. Um, here is what the finished product generally looks like. Take a small portion of that. Here. That right there. Gently spoon some of our apples and cider sauce over the top. Some of the fresh cranberry sauce. Peppery microgreens. And there is a new take on a Thanksgiving tradition recipe. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back here live. I am now joined by Ellen Thompson, a registered dietitian with CHI Health. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. I did want to quickly mention that we are socially distanced six feet, and that's why we're not wearing a mask, but everybody else here in the room with us today, the crew has a mask on. Um, so we, we feel that those guidelines are very important and just wanted to point that out. We also wanted to remind you, submit those questions in the live chat bar for Ellen, um, and we'll do our best to answer them as we talk nutrition. So nutrition has been a big part of this quarantine and, and pandemic for a lot of people. I know those initial few months were really hard for me. So we're talking about the quarantine 15, weight gain. Um, what caused those extra pounds do you think for people during during that really first few months of quarantine? Yeah, I think it was so many things. Um, people were working from home and I can't tell you how many times I heard, I just keep walking by the fridge and it's there. So that would decrease activity probably was what caused some of that weight gain. Mm -hmm. And then do you think it's also some, you know, we were stuck at home um, not a lot of, you know, gyms were doing different things and maybe people didn't feel safe going. Obviously exercise is a big part of that. Absolutely. So paired with, with being close access to the fridge, probably kind of a combination of. Yes. And those of us who are so used to going to the gym to work out at home, isn't always the easiest. So a lot of us have had to adapt to that. Yes. Very true. I know I did. And working out from home is tough. You don't have all the equipment. Yes. So how do I lose weight or not gain weight during the holidays? Because every year this is a challenge. Now we have COVID packed on top of that. Yeah. So what are some of the tips that you have for people, um, you know, that really want to keep their weight in check during this time? Yeah, I think definitely setting yourself up to be successful. So restock your fridge and your pantry with good options, fruits, vegetables, but also nuts and seeds, healthful dairy can all be good options. And I almost think now more than ever, those comfort foods are going to mean so much more. We're going to want a taste of normal. Um, so really enjoy all foods just in moderation, move on, you know, share your leftovers, give it to a neighbor, put it in the freezer. So you're not always doing that. When you're going shopping, I know we all have those regular temptations. If you go down every aisle, like I do, I want to grab for the Oreos or, you know, yeah. whatever I'm craving. Um, what are some healthier snack options that don't have to taste like rice cakes or, you know, <laughs> something that we don't necessarily enjoy eating? What are some snacks that are good for you, um, but you don't have to have that guilt? Yeah, but they taste good too. So I love to recommend just fruits with nuts or nut butters can be an easy option. You can make homemade granola bars, uh, homemade energy balls. Again, yogurt, cheese sticks are all easy things to keep stocked. Uh, the holidays also mean some festive cocktails for some people. Yes. Can I have a drinks um, without worrying about that weight gain or where do I need to kind of draw that line or what things do you recommend for that? Yeah, really, I, I always encourage my patients all things in moderation. So the recommendation is one drink a day for women, two drinks a day or less for men. So just following those guidelines, really be mindful of your mixers. Um, sometimes we tend to overeat while we're consuming alcohol. So just making sure we're being really smart with our choices. Talking a little bit about just diet trends in general, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? I know this is something that it's, a lot of people are trying. Yeah. Um, is this something that you feel is effective or is there data to back it up? Yeah, there is a decent amount of research out there specifically to insulin resistance and sometimes blood sugars. Um, I find for some of my patients that come in on intermittent fasting, 
it just decreases the temptation to eat. But what I always like to remind them is you still have to plan to get all of those good foods in. If you're not going to menu plan or think ahead, you're still not going to get, you know, fruits and vegetables in a short eating window. We had a question come in from a viewer, and this is something that I would like to know as well. Is it okay to have a big splurge day on Thanksgiving and then get back to healthy eating, or should we change traditional recipes to be lower in calories? Um, I think you can kind of mix them. I mean, definitely revamping recipes to be lower in calories, higher in fiber um, are good options. But I think just really eating food, enjoying it and moving on. I hate to use the word cheat day or cheat meal. Mm -hmm. Usually you're going to be super tired, you know, zap your energy. You're going to have blood sugar swings. So if we can take a step back and enjoy that small portion, that plate, save it for later. Again, freeze for use at a later time. What are some good substitutes that you would recommend? I know um, one of my favorites is Greek yogurt in place of sour yes. cream. Um, things that like that, that people can still enjoy. Maybe they want to have mashed potatoes and they mm -hmm. want that dollop of sour cream, yes. but you can use Greek yogurt instead. Or what are some other substitutes that people can kind of play with um, to just put that healthier spin on maybe some of our favorite foods? Yeah, not just even decreasing calories, but enhancing nutrition. So trying whole wheat flour instead of of regular flour. Um, substitutes for sugar, looking at maybe honey or, or maple syrup, you can use less of that. I also love the Greek yogurt one um, or applesauce instead of oil. Those are all some options to try. And really the recipes do pretty well. Mm -hmm. Where is a good at, Where is a good place to look for healthy recipes? I always oh. wonder that. You know, you can Google anything, but what's a good resource that yeah, you use? I mean, I'm a Pinterest lover myself, but I'll encourage people to look at the American Diabetes Association. They have excellent swaps on there. Cooking Light is another good option, or anything labeled the Dash Diet, Dietary Approaches to Stopping Hypertension. All have really good substitutions. And we also have some really good healthy recipes listed on blogs.chihealth.com. Mm -hmm. So be sure to check that out as well. Um, talking about snacking again. Uh, we might have good intentions and we eat really well at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but our snacking sabotages us. Yeah. What are some good habits to get into um, or to make sure that your snacking is really not going off the rails? Yeah, I think first we just need to get distraction foods out of the house. So if I know I have ice cream or cookies and I see that every time I go to the fridge or the pantry, I'm going to grab them until they're gone. So really get the distraction foods out and again, restock with good options. Snacking can be very supportive for weight and um, blood sugar and diabetes. So just having those better options around again, I keep going back to fruits and vegetables, but really it can do a lot for us. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about kind of our mindset when it comes to food, because mm -hmm. I know everybody kind of has a different one and we all have a different relationship with food. For me, it's mm -hmm. like I can do really well for a while. And then when I can eat my cheat meals or mm -hmm. um, favorite foods, I kind of tend to binge. Mm -hmm. What is a good way to have you know, to, to foster a positive relationship with food. Um, and so when we get to these holidays and things, you don't totally overdo it and yeah. kind of steer your progress. I think it's incorporating that food throughout the year, not just, oh, on one day, only eat this. Really, it can be things that we incorporate all the time. Um, and food is very, you know, memories and family and has so much connection to it. So I think just giving yourself a little bit of grace that I can eat and enjoy this food. And maybe again, in two months, I'll want to make Thanksgiving dinner again. Awesome. It's just really balance and portions and, and trying to be mindful of your plate. I know that we touched on this in the last video, um, but a lot of people might have smaller gatherings this year. They're not mm. going to be roasting a whole turkey yeah. or maybe a ham. What are some <laughs> other ideas that you would have for that really good festive Thanksgiving or Christmas food, um, but you don't have to spend the whole day in the kitchen? Yeah, you can just do smaller portions of everything. Or honestly, if you want to do the cooking, freeze it for later. We can use so much of that turkey meat or ham at, for use at a later time. Throw it into soups, throw it into stir fries. Um, so we really, if, if you're going to put the work in and, and you don't mind freezing, that can be a great option. And then lastly, because I know this is also, you know, something that a lot of people do now, plant-based diets. Yeah. Um, obviously a lot of people aren't eating the turkey. Yeah. Um, what are some good ideas for them to incorporate that same flavor or, you know, just recipe ideas for that plant-based diet on Thanksgiving. Yeah, things with nuts, beans, tofu. Um, I'm not an expert on flavor profiles, but I encourage people to really explore plant-based recipes online. So many patients come in and like, oh, I want to go plant-based, but then they're just eating like 
ranch and carrots and celery. And I'm like, okay, you got to think beyond that because there's so much that plant foods can do, but um, legumes and beans and lentils and all of that great stuff can take on a wonderful flavor. And really quickly, because I just saw this come in. Do yeah. you have any tips to keep us from eating nonstop between now and New Year's Day? It's so hard to resist the treats from friends and family. Yeah. Um, cut the portions in half, give some to your neighbor, donate it, or again, freeze it. Eat it later. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank Very you. helpful tips. For more information on portion sizes, recipes, and other tips, visit our webpage that should be listed at the bottom of the screen. And again, keep submitting those questions. We have our first Fitbit drawing now. Two winners we're announcing. You're going to be winning the Fitbit Inspire 2. So our first winner is Judy Drown. Judy Drown is our first winner today. And our second winner is Geneva Ruzica. Ruzica? Geneva Ruzica. You guys are the winners of two Fitbits, one for each of you, and we'll be announcing three more today throughout this webinar as we go. Well, it's hard to get motivated when it's cold and dark outside. We talked about the diet challenges, but also the fitness challenges, and a lot of people trying to work out from home. So our friends at Orange Theory show us some exercises that you can do from the comfort of your living room. Hi, my name is Cindy, and I'm the head coach at Orange Theory Fitness West Omaha Studio. Now, even though our studios have reopened with reduced capacity classes, I realize that there are certain situations that make working out at home from time to time a necessity. And studies have shown us that a little bit of physical movement every day is going to be really important for our physical health and our emotional well-being. So I'm going to show you a quick 10-minute workout you can do anywhere with no equipment, and I guarantee you'll get a positive mood adjustment. All right, guys, so we're going to do a quick warm-up. Three moves, one minute each, starting with some arm circles. We'll extend those arms out from the shoulders. Take tiny little circles. You can go forward, you can go back, you can even make the circles bigger. But we'll get that shoulder joint warmed up for about one minute. Then we'll go into some knee raises. You'll alternate the knee, lifting it up and down. And if you want to get a little more blood flow going, we'll bring those arms down as that knee comes up. And then the last move is going to get the blood pumping and the heart rate up a little bit, jogging in place. So just a little step from one foot to the other. Or if you want to make it low impact, we'll do a little bit of marching. So we do each of those three moves for one minute. You have a three minute warm up. Then we're going to go into some squatting. Now, squatting is a foundational movement pattern using big muscle groups. So we'll start with our feet about hip width apart or a little wider. Drive the hips down and back, keep the chest lifted, and then lift all the way back up to that starting position. We'll do that for 20 seconds. That will be followed by a squat jack, hopping the feet wide, driving the hips back, hopping back up. Another option for this to make it low impact is to step side to side and squat. The last one is gonna be a pulsing half squat where we hold that squat at the bottom, keeping chest lifted, lift about halfway up. Then you'll take a 20 second rest break. So doing this for three rounds will be four minutes of work. We're going to finish up with a little bit of core work, beginning with 20 seconds of a crunch. We'll lay down on the floor, knees bent, fingertips behind the head, lifting the shoulder blades off the floor and lowering down. Right into a reverse crunch, hands by the hips. We'll bring those knees in toward the chest, tapping the feet back down. After that, you'll do 20 seconds of rest. Completing three rounds will be three minutes. So we have three minutes, four, Three for a 10 minute workout, super simple. Now at Orange Theory Fitness, we would love to have you join us where your first workout is always free. You'll be led by a certified coach through a heart rate based interval training program. And our Orange community is always super welcoming. We practice social distancing and your staff's always in PPE. Now we know that these are struggling times, but with a positive mindset and a little bit of movement every day, you're gonna come out stronger on the other side. I hope you have a wonderful day. Welcome back live. We're going to have more from Orange Theory a little later on in this webinar. And also coming up, we're going to hear from one of CHI Health sleep experts about how to get a good night's sleep and what might be getting in the way of that. Again, you can submit your questions through the Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. Well, we talked about how hard it is to focus on eating right through the holidays and through quarantine, but we also know that there's a lot on people's minds and our mental well-being is so important right now. And here joining me today is... Thank you so much for Absolutely. being here, Jessie. Thank you. We've talked a lot lately we over have. the pandemic because yes. mental health is so important and it's been a big, big focus um, on people's overall well-being mm -hmm. during the pandemic. So we're talking about 
we know that the pandemic has brought on extra stressors, but what about the holidays? Because we know that there's seasonal depression and extra stressors that come along with Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, how do people manage all of this? Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. And I think when it comes to the holidays, um, that's the number one thing, kind of like you talked about is the demands, right? Um, holidays are such an exciting time, but sometimes the excitement is a little bit diminished because of the demands. And so now on top of it with the pandemic, there's some extra, what should I do? What's right? What's not right? Um, and I think it goes really back to what do you normally do? And, and maybe modifying those, um, those, you know, traditions or whatnot, but not forgetting the reason for the season. I, I know we hear that term a lot, but, um, what do you normally do that brings you joy during these seasons and preparing for that? Yeah, I just wanted to buy a shirt the other day that said choose joy because yes. it's so true. If you focus on the good and the yeah. positive, it's a lot easier yes. to get through the day. Yes. Um, we also talked about controlling what you can control, mm -hmm. focusing on that. That's been a big message that um, that you have promoted during this pandemic. And why is that so important for people? Because I know that we're all struggling to kind of just really cope with it all. When mm -hmm. is this going to be over? You know, when can I see my friends and family? When can I just do normal things that I once enjoyed? Mm -hmm. Why is that so important to focus on what yeah. we can't control? Control is something that um, provokes anxiety when we do not have control. A lot of times what we hear is, you know, when I feel like I can't control something, that's when my anxiety or the depression might be the worst. So I always say control the controllables. Um, what can we control in this situation? Uh, a lot of times it's, it's kind of like the old metaphor, uh, worries like a rocking chair, you rock and you rock, but you don't go anywhere. Um, and that's so very true because we think of the what ifs or, or kind of the, if I don't do this, then this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And then what happens is we end up worrying about things that aren't even going to happen. So what can we do in this moment to control my next steps? And that's what I really encourage everybody to stop and think, what can I do right now that's going to determine my next step? Going back to the holidays, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all used to either going to gatherings or hosting gatherings. And how can you deal with demanding relatives that, you know, maybe you're being really safe with mm -hmm. COVID and you're following all of the guidelines and maybe your relative or your friend doesn't see it that way? You know, how can you deal with those demands? Yeah. And that's a great question because it has come up a lot. Um, I think it's going back to what you believe in and setting those boundaries, understanding that everybody has their own view of what the current situation is and how they're handling it. Um, and it really goes back to what is right for you. If, if you choose to do something that isn't right for you or what you don't believe in, chances are you're not going to be enjoying it anyways. So really explaining to your relatives and, you know, I, I would love for you to be here. Um, this is just a difficult time right now. And, and for myself and my family, this is what we are going to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe when this is over, we can have our traditions or we can have a gathering, but for right now, in order to keep everybody safe and for us to be able to enjoy it, this is something that we're going to do. This came in from a viewer. How do I not feel down about not having big family get togethers? Family traditions can't happen this year. And that's really hard. It is. It is. Yeah. And I think that is something that's going to be very difficult because really this, these are the first major holiday seasons that we're going into during this pandemic. And, and, you know, I think a lot of it is feeling down, but then also how do we explain to our children? How do we explain to other family members? And remember, it goes back to controlling the controllables, but what can we do right now that still brings us joy? You know, if, wake, if waking up on Christmas morning or waking up on Thanksgiving morning and the tradition might be that um, I'm cooking a turkey with grandma, somehow still trying to incorporate that if grandma can't be there. Can grandma be there on a Zoom call? Can, can grandma still be there somehow on Christmas morning? And, and understanding that it is okay to feel a little sad. These are a lot of changes that are thrown at us that we're not used to. Mm -hmm. So allow yourself to feel down, allow yourself to feel sad for a little bit, and then move forward with the things that you want to still do. We talked about sadness. What about the guilt? Maybe guilt. that you're not mm -hmm. including grandma and grandpa this yeah. year, or you've decided to decline their invitation for a get together. How do you deal with that guilt that you feel? Yeah. I think give yourself a little grace, um, that, which is really difficult to do, especially, um, you know, maybe if you're one hosting and you have a lot of those demands or these are the things that I'm used to doing, but understanding that if we don't experience the guilt and we don't talk about it, a lot of times it can turn to some frustrations and even resentment. So really working through that and talking with your family member and saying, you know, grandma, I do feel guilty that you can't be here and I'm sorry, but right now, in order for us to be able to have future gatherings in the future and, and to be together, this is the best decision for us. Mm -hmm. 
why might I seem to be angry or on edge all the time? I think this goes back to anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel like when I have anxiety, I'm very irritable. Yes. So why might I feel that way? Irritability and being on edge are, are key indicators of anxiety and depression. And I think one of the biggest things is we have to look at what is all changing around us. You know, whether it's your kids going to in-person school one day and remote learning the next day, or maybe you're in the office one day and the next day you're not. Everything around us is so rapidly changing that sometimes we don't feel like we have both feet on the ground before the next step um, changes again. So, you know, anxiety um, does bring around irritability and, and maybe on edge and it's recognizing that. And, and when you're recognizing that you're a little bit more irritable, putting in good practices, whether it's sleep hygiene, relaxation, exercise. Yes, those types of we're going to be talking about sleep hygiene yes. coming up. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, you know, what are some signs that our level of stress and anxiety, or maybe even the winter blues and depression are more than we can handle on our mm -hmm. own? You know, when do we know to ask her help? Great question. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to when when it's to the point that it's impairing your day-to-day -day functioning, when it's to the point that you can't get through your daily tasks without maybe, you know, feeling down, anxious, irritable, you've tried to do things to cope with it. Nothing's helping. Um, you know, sometimes some of my clients will say, my husband really started to notice that I wasn't happy or I was anxious, or mm -hmm. I started to feel way um, more weight on me or my kids and said, you know, mom, why are you upset all the time? Sometimes when those closest to us kind of bring up those, you know, questions, mm -hmm. then maybe we take a step back and say, is this a little bit more than what I can handle on my own? Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to touch on the little ones, kids, yes. you know, the holidays and the traditions that follow for kids. That's, a, that's everything. You yes. know, you, we all look back on our memories and yeah. of growing up. So how can you still make the holidays, you know, special for them. And maybe it's not going to look the same, but what are some ways yeah. that you can still really bring the joy? The one thing I love about children is how resilient they are. They truly are so resilient. And when you look at the children right now, they've adapted to so much in such, you know, a short amount of time. Um, so I think it's not forgetting about the traditions and the fun things that you normally do and understanding that it's okay to have those conversations, those true, honest conversations of, Right now we can't do this because of this, but we still can do this. Mm -hmm. And keeping those memories and those traditions alive and still making it fun for them. Um, kids are concrete thinkers. They are meant to be you know, in the moment. And a lot of times they don't think way ahead. So if, if it's about what are we doing right now that can help them through this and talking very rationally, but to their level, chances are they're going to be okay. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much, Chelsea, yeah, for all the absolutely. advice. We're so happy you're here. Um, and again, if you or someone you know is showing signs of severe depression or anxiety or struggling, call our helpline. That number is at the bottom of your screen, 402-717-HOPE. Well, coming up right now, we're going to hear from our friends at Orange Theory. But before, but and after that, I'm sorry, after that, we're going to have our sleep expert, Dr. Aaron Robinson, here to answer all those questions about getting good rest. Hello everyone, my name is Bianca Keller. I'm the head trainer here at Orange City Fitness Midtown. Although I do wish I was with you in person, I'm super excited to have the opportunity to talk to you all about exercising and sleep. That's right, sleep. Study shows that 30 minutes of aerobic activity can help improve one's sleep. So on top of the actual workout, that's a bonus, right? So speaking of workout, let's get our burn on. All right, so today I have a quick 11 and a half minute workout that you can do anywhere in your home. We provide all sorts of options here at Orange Series, so I'll give you some options for your workout too. But let's go ahead and start with your warm up. It's going to be a three minute warm up, three exercises. We're going to do 30 seconds a piece, 15 second break in between. So let's start with some jumping jacks. Your feet pop out and your arms go up and overhead. An option instead of the jump, just step outside to the side and let those arms come on up. Right after our jumping jacks, we're going to do a dynamic toe reach. I'm going to turn to the side so you can see me. You're going to have a soft bend in the knees, hinge at the hips. Reach for those toes, straighten out your legs, bend those knees into your chest, straighten out your legs, feel those hamstrings, those backs of your legs open up a little bit, get warmed up for our lower body work. 30 seconds here, 15 second break after. Third and final move of our warm up is gonna be a squat. Feet about hip distance apart, push back those hips, weight into the heels, squeeze through the glutes and come up to a stand. Again, we'll be here for 30 seconds, 15 second break in between, and we're gonna complete two rounds here. Three minute warm up. All right, so the next segment of our workout is lower body. It's gonna be about four and a half minutes long. Just so you know, we train in endurance, strength, and power here at Orange Series. So we wanna bring that to you 
at home. Our first move is gonna be strength and then our next move is gonna be power which will help get the heart rate up and get sweating a little bit. So let's talk about our exercises. First one is the lateral lunge. We'll be on for 30 seconds. Nice wide stance, wider than hip distance apart. Push back those hips and we're just gonna alternate coming up to a stand between left and right. Really working the inner and backs of those legs. We'll do that for 30 seconds with a 15 second break. We're gonna complement that with a power move. You're gonna drive the knee to the inside of the chest. This is called the speed skater lunge. We're going wide and then we're staying low. An option, take a step, knee comes to the inside of the chest. We're gonna be there for only 15 seconds, considering that this is really gonna elevate the heart rate. We'll take a 15 second break after. Right after we have a squat to a leg lift for 30 seconds. We're gonna come down into a squat at the, start, at the starting position. We're gonna let that leg lift out while keeping our core nice and tight. We don't wanna tip over like a teapot. So really squeeze that core as that leg moves out laterally. 30 seconds here, 15 second recovery, and then the power moves coming in hot. We're gonna go into jump squat. So, Weight into the heels, nice big jump at the top, trying to gain max height for 15. Option, come to a calf raise and work those calves instead. Pretty much the same range of motion. We're gonna do two rounds here, taking 15 second recoveries in between. Enjoy. All right, everybody, good job on that workout. Now, if you pair that workout with an outdoor jog, run, or walk, you're good to go. Now, we really do hope to see you at any of our Orange Theory Fitness Omaha locations. The accountability the encouragement, the high energy in this studio is truly unmatchable and we would love for you all to be a part of it. Don't forget your first class is on us and we train to all fitness levels as well. We help our members reach their goals. So if you have a goal, come see us and we can help you get there. And on top of it, you get a special rate being an employee at CHI. Thanks for all you do and we really hope to see you soon. Thanks. Welcome back here live. Before we get into our sleep health, we do want to announce our next Fitbit winner. The winner is Christine Urbom. Christine Urbom, you have won a Fitbit. We will be in touch with you to get you your prize, and we'll have two more winners coming up here throughout the webinar today. Well, joining me now is Dr. Aaron Robinson, ENT doctor and sleep expert. Um, sleep is something that I know that we all wish we had more of. <laughs> I know I do, um, but, but our sleep health you know, for some has been a challenge during the pandemic. We've got, you know, kids at school, but they're, but they're at school at home. Yeah. It's just, a, it's a challenge. So talk about um, first, you know, how our sleep habits can impact our health. So sleep is so important. And as you said, with the pandemic, I mean, I've got kids and for the first part, when they all got sent home after spring break, it was a free for all, right? They didn't have school to wake up for. They were up really late, waking up really late in the day, sleeping in. And the sleep schedule was just decimated. I'm sure I'm not the only person that experienced that. But you know, we're kind of thinking about how does sleep affect health in two different subsets. In kids, it can really affect how their development goes and how their learning goes and their focus. And so when kids are at home school, they may, you know, on the computer, they may not be getting the proper sleep because they don't have to wake up and get ready. They don't have that routine in the morning. And so their learning is going to be impacted for sure. Mm -hmm. For adults, when we don't get enough sleep, it's probably more detrimental. Our bodies are more fragile as we age. And so we're going to have things like increase in our blood pressure, decrease in our mental faculties, our ability to concentrate. Um, we may have increase in weight gain and a lot of other things like that. So mm -hmm. yeah, so that that COVID-15 or the weight gain during quarantine can yeah. also have an impact on your sleep. Oh, for sure. I mean, gaining weight makes you sleep worse because you have an increased risk of sleep apnea. On the other side, not sleeping enough can make us gain weight. And that can happen through two mechanisms. One is because we're tired, we don't get enough sleep, we're gonna wake up tired. We're gonna be looking for something easy to get that's gonna satisfy that craving that we have. So we might reach for the bag of chips, we might reach for the candy bar, we might reach for something sweet, something not healthy, just to give us the boost. We might reach for something with caffeine in it to give us that boost. And a lot of those caffeinated drinks have sugar and things like that. And so that right there is going to predispose us to gaining weight because we're making poorer choices, trying to supplement our sleep. It's like having a credit card debt. You're never going to get out of that debt until you fully pay it. And we have to pay our sleep debt somehow. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's by supplementing it with things that make us feel better or feel energized temporarily. The other thing is we have hormones in our body that are regulated a lot by sleep. One is called ghrelin, that's the go hormone. That's the one that makes us have an appetite. One is called leptin, that's the one that says, slow down, stop, you're full. And when we don't get enough sleep, the stop, slow down, you're full hormone goes down and the let's eat hormone goes up. And so 
by process of elimination, we're going to be hungrier and we're going to eat more and we're going to make poor choices because our judgment is impaired. Mm -hmm. Really quick, if you have questions for Dr. Robinson, please submit them in the chat. We'll do our best to answer them as we go. And then Dr. Quimby is also gonna be coming back live here with us briefly. So if you have questions for him, please do submit those now as well. Back to sleep, um, is there a difference between quality versus quantity? So number of hours, you know, when it comes to our sleep. Absolutely. The number of hours you sleep is really not as important as how well you sleep. And in sleep, there's lots of stages, right? We have, and you can all think about when you sleep, the stages, you're gonna go through these, everybody does. The first 10 to 15 minutes, we call it stage one. You're kind of getting to that point where your body's relaxed. You're starting to almost fall asleep, but you're easily arousable, right? You, you might be able to snap out of that quickly. And then you move into the next two stages, stage two and three, and you're gradually getting into a deeper and deeper sleep. What we really need is to get into that stage three sleep, that deep sleep, that restful sleep, because that's where our body can re-energize re and rejuvenate itself. Mm -hmm. And then along with that, getting into that deep sleep, we get into the point where we can have REM sleep. And REM sleep is really important for restoration of our memories and uh, rejuvenation of our bodies. And, and it kind of affects our immunity. All these types of things are part of REM sleep. So if we don't get into that deep sleep, doesn't matter how long you sleep, mm -hmm. you're not gonna be feeling like you've had enough rest. So we talked about kind of when kids got called back uh, or school was kind of not canceled, but they were sent home right. and what we're gonna be experiencing the same thing or something similar with the holiday breaks. Yeah. So kids are gonna be not in their typical sleep schedule. We've got, you know, they're probably turning to electronics for entertainment because they can't really be with their friends or at least, yeah. you know, it's encouraged for them not to be. Um, how can you keep your kids on a healthy sleep schedule or when is a good time for them to really get back before they have to go back to the class? That's a better question because <laughs> I was going to say, you're never going to keep your kids on a sleep schedule on break, at least in the beginning, because they're going to feel the freedom of mm -hmm. not being in school and not having to wake up at a time. But getting back into it, um, we already mentioned a little bit about sleep hygiene. Having a routine is super important, especially for kids, but don't forget that for yourself as well. Making sure that they don't have electronics or a blue screen in front of their face about an hour before bedtime, letting their brains do what they're supposed to do. The melatonin production that comes through avoiding that blue light is so important. And that helps the kids start to feel tired, making sure they're going through the same steps that they might as they're getting ready to go back to school, brushing the teeth, laying in bed, reading a book, doing a story, whatever your home routine is, doing that routine. And maybe they're gonna go to sleep a little bit later on the break time, that's fine. But as long as you're keeping the routine, it's going to be easier to transition back to the point where you have to wake up early and get to school on time. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions submitted live. Is there another way to prevent snoring besides strips and sleep studies? There's a lot of ways to prevent <laughs> snoring besides those things. The most important thing to remember is that snoring is a symptom. It's not a disease. And so the first thing, the most important thing is we have to figure out why you're snoring. And we may not always know why, but the number one reason in Americans is sleep apnea. That's why the sleep study is so important because we have to make sure you don't have sleep apnea. If you do, you have to be treated, otherwise your heart can suffer. So after we find out whether you have sleep apnea or not, then there's a lot of other options. We look at the nose, how well does air flow through there? We look at the mouth and the way your bite is and where your tongue sits and how does that affect snoring? And there's a lot of things we can do to address those issues. That's a much bigger topic I think than we have time for today, but um, there's lots of things we can do to help with snoring. There's no cure necessarily, but there's a lot of things to make it better. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are severely sleep deprived for weeks or even months, how do you suggest getting back on track? If you have been sleeping only five hours, is there a recommended way to move back to that seven or nine? Just start with baby steps. You're never gonna go from five to nine. Like That's just not gonna happen. It's hard, your body's in a routine. And so increase the amount of time you wanna sleep by going to bed 20, 30 minutes early, and then just moving that up, you know? And again, for adults, it really goes back to sleep hygiene, just like with kids. We have to have a routine. We have to let our bodies do what they're supposed to do. We have to let the melatonin work to make our body get those signals to start to shut down. And as we get older, we're gonna sleep less. Our brain produces much less melatonin as we get older. As a lot of elderly people have issues getting to sleep early and then staying asleep in this deep sleep. And that's partially because of the decrease of melatonin. Mm -hmm. So routine is really important. And then talk to your doctor. There may be a role for supplementing melatonin in your diet. Is it okay to nap during the day if I'm working from home? I guess that's probably a question of, is my mind kind of capable of being productive or is it beneficial? Um, I know kids take naps during yeah. school, so. Hey, 
naps are great. There's been a lot of studies that look at what we call power naps, right? And even in some countries, it's encouraged to take a nap. And there's, you know, some places in Japan have like nap cafes. You go there on your break and you take a short nap and you go back to work. So naps are really great. It's not for everybody, but if you're getting into that, you know, giving yourself a, at least a, a, a segment of time, 15 to 30 minutes, you're going to have a restorative experience. If you're giving yourself more, you might get into that really deep sleep where it's harder to be aroused. You might feel like it wasn't worth it or you're going to feel tired throughout the day. So mm -hmm. there's a sweet spot there, but I think naps are good for some people. This is a question I've always wondered myself because I am a night owl. So is it possible myself to become a morning person? Is that something that you can train your body to do or is it just, you know, something that you're either one or the other? Well, that's a good question. Um, being a night owl and a morning person, <laughs> I would say yes, it is. But again, it's kind of just that transition, right? I mean, for some people, their job or their lifestyle or their family circumstances require that they maybe are a night owl. Maybe that's when they're the most productive because that's when they have quiet. Maybe that's when the kids are asleep. Maybe that's when, you know, you have moments to yourself. And so and for some people, they wake up early and go to work. It may be challenging to wake up like at three or four in the morning. Like that's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. And so just looking at your own circumstance, looking at where you can carve out that time is important. Again, we talked about how sleep is like a debt. You have to make up that debt somewhere. And so if you're going to want to be a morning person, you're going to have to go to bed earlier and you're going to have to do that through changing your routine and through really focusing on the priorities that you have. So we talked about how gaining weight can affect our sleep, but can losing sleep make you gain weight? Absolutely. So when you lose sleep, again, you're going to make more poor choices. You're going to, you're going to be hungry. You're going to be looking for that pick me up. And so that may lead you to sugary snacks. That may lead you to caffeinated beverages that are going to have sugar in them. And that's going to potentially increase your caloric intake, which leads to weight gain. And then also it affects those hormones that tell you when to eat and when to stop eating. Um, but if you were to, if you're overweight, you're going to sleep worse, most likely, because you're probably predisposing yourself to having sleep apnea. If you lose weight, you're going to sleep better, almost certainly, because you're going to have a lower risk of sleep apnea. You're going to have less weight and pressure on your chest, affecting your lungs, how well you're breathing, affecting snoring, affecting how you know comfortable you can get during sleep. And so weight loss is probably one of the best things you could do for sleep. If you're looking for one thing to do, it's weight loss. And it's hard during the holidays. You've talked a lot about that mm -hmm. with some of our other guests. You're going to have challenges, but mm -hmm. focusing on that ultimate goal, the long-term goal, that's what's going to get you to better sleep. Another question submitted live, is it better to stay on a schedule or get the sleep when you can? It's always better to be on a schedule, but if you're a new mom, you're going to sleep when you can. You know, every circumstance is different, um, but you've got to find something that works for you. And the most important thing is that if you get off the schedule, you just live with it and you move forward. If you beat yourself up, you're always, you're just going to get into a cycle of never improving. So last question, we have time for one more question. What are some tips for getting enough sleep? Maybe you're someone that doesn't really monitor your sleep very well, um, or need some things to kind of encourage it or like melatonin or what are some, what are some tips that you have? Yeah. So like I had said before, melatonin is a good option for some people. You should talk to your doctor before starting that. Um, but that's something that can help, especially in older people. Sometimes it's hard for your brain to get to the point where you can relax. Just like in, as we talked about with kids, getting rid of devices, turning off the TV, turning off your phone, don't look at your phone in bed, try and make your bedroom a sacred space for sleeping. Don't bring those other things in there that are going to distract you. Reading is a much better activity before you fall asleep than watching a TV show on your phone. And I'm being hypocritical by saying that because I do that too. Everybody does. But if you're really having issues sleeping, if you're really having an issue with a routine and you want to get better at that, you have to have good sleep hygiene. You have to have a routine. All right. Thank you so much for you're being welcome. here, Dr. Robinson. We yeah. really appreciate it. And again, this webinar is going to be posted on our website. So you'll be able to access all of these live Q&As um, later on after we are done. And again, we have one more Fitbit winner. I'm going to announce right now our final winner of the day. Actually, I lied. We have two more. Our first winner is Thane Moore. Thane Moore, you are a winner of the Fitbit Inspire 2. And our final winner is Sandy Yilk. Sandy Yilk, our final winner of the day of the Fitbit Inspire 2. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. We feel it's been a pretty beneficial day just to talk about all the things and the questions that we have related to COVID. Um, Dr. David Quimby is back with us for a final Q&A. 
Dr. Quimby, thank you again for joining us. Wanted to ask if I'm sick or if, even if I'm not sick, how many times should I be changing my mask or washing my mask? Um, first, I would say if you're not sick and just out and about, um, there's no real clear guidelines on this and it really depends if you're using the disposable masks or a reusable cloth mask. If it's a disposable mask and it gets wet or anything like that, it's considered no good and needs to be changed. Um, if it's a cloth mask, you should probably do it at least at the end of the day, chuck it into the washing machine. Um, so it's good to have a few to rotate through. Uh, if you're sick, ideally, you're not changing a mask at all because you're staying home and not needing to wear a mask. Right. Um, another question submitted live. Do we know anything about how COVID affects pregnant women? Again, relatively new virus. All right. But from what we have seen so far, uh, unlike some other infections, it doesn't seem to be worse in pregnant women than in non-pregnant people. How do you handle people who want to hug you or who won't wear a mask in your home? What is a polite way to remind them to back off? Nobody ever wants to hug the infection guy, so not an issue. Um, if they don't want, if they do not live in your home and they do not want to wear a mask in your home, they do not necessarily have to be invited into your home. Okay. Um, there are little social cues that you can have for people who uh, are more demonstrative of their affection than other folk. Uh, a lot of that's just innate and part of your normal self. And apparently I send off like anti-hug vibes because nobody ever tries. Um, but you can just like lean back, step back, and people pick up on that cue. Can UV light revitalize masks? I bought one on Amazon recently. You, uh, ultraviolet light can work to sterilize things, and at hospitals that reprocess their N95 masks, it can be used to sterilize it. However, there are checks with that that you can use to make sure it's actually being sterilized which you're probably not going to be able to do in the home environment. Also, without knowing what was purchased on Amazon, I don't know if there's adequate UV in that. However, for standard home use, a simple cloth mask is, okay, is fair and you don't need special precautions. You can put it in the laundry or hand wash. If you test positive for COVID-19, how do you keep others in your home safe? I know I've heard some cases where some people in the home get it and then others don't even though they're living in the same space. So what are your tips there? Well, one problem is if you test positive today and you institute all these measures uh, and maybe even never go home, that doesn't do anything for two or three days before where you might've been able to still infect them. But ideally you want to just stay as far away from them as possible. Everybody's home is different. So you might not have your own bedroom or your own bathroom. You just need to try to separate as much as possible. Ideally, sleep in your own room. Ideally, wear a mask yourself in your own house at all times, which is why it's important to sleep in your own room because you should not be sleeping with a mask. Um, if you have one kitchen, I mean, hey, you're sick. Maybe somebody can bring the food to you in your room so you don't have to go into the common areas as much. Yeah, wouldn't okay. that be nice? Yeah. Uh, we see doctors like yourself using hand sanitizer before taking off masks. Do you recommend we do the same? I see so many people pulling masks off right as they leave the store. Right. Um, it's a slight difference where you are, uh, a hospital versus community environment. But the ideal situation is you would consider the outer surface of the mask as contaminated. So if you're going to be touching that, you would want to have your hands cleaned afterward. And also anytime you're bringing your hands up to your face, it might be a good idea to have them clean. So if you have a little portable hand sanitizer, it's always useful to do that before putting on or taking off your mask anyway. I have to ask you this because you're always very honest and we always appreciate that about you. What are you doing for the holidays this year? Well, I usually work on Thanksgiving. Um, because up until this year or in last year, I made the schedule and that way I don't work Christmas. Well, <laughs> okay. Oh, but, but if you, if you weren't working Thanksgiving, okay. how would you celebrate? All right. Uh, generally what happens is because I'm working Thanksgiving and I feel a little bit guilty about working and not being at home. My wife and our kids will go visit their, uh, my in-laws in Kansas city. 
it's not I'm trying to avoid them. I like them, okay? <laughs> um, but they're not doing that this year. We're staying home. Usually around Christmas time, um, our father-in-law, my father-in-law will come up to visit with us and that is not going to be happening this year. We are staying home. Uh, another question that came in, school districts are experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks. Do you think it's necessary to test entire schools or even entire districts? That would be a very awesome thing if we had the capability. Um, I don't think there is the capability to test that many uh, people. I Most of the information that I have is from my uh, child school at Papillion uh, School District, and they're actually doing pretty well. Uh, probably because all of the kids there are wearing masks. From what they're finding, at least what they're releasing to us, most of the cases there are brought into the school and not necessarily spread a whole lot inside the school. So behaviors outside of school doing well can try to keep it out of the schools. This is the last question that we have time for, and I love that okay. I'm asking you this because you always have your, your hydro flask or your bottle of water. And I always see you removing your mask to drink it. So how do you feel about the masks that allow you to sip through a straw? Okay. Um, my, my cup has a straw. My mask does not have a hole. A mask that has a hole is not much of a mask at all. Is it possible to have overlapping layers so that there's not a lot of airflow in there? Sure. Okay. I would have concern though, if you consider the outside surface of your mask is contaminated, you're rubbing this straw over this potentially contaminated surface and chucking it straight into your mouth. Always a wealth of information, Dr. Quimby. So okay. thank you so much for being here. Okay. We really appreciate it. Um, and we wanna thank all of our experts today who joined us and we hope that you were able to take something helpful away, a tip or two that will help you navigate life during this challenging time. And if you missed any part of this presentation or wanna watch it again, share it with your friends and family, it will be posted online at chihealth.com slash wellness webinar. So thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a happy and safe holiday season and you stay healthy.